Good morning. We'd like to welcome all of you to Church Creek this morning. If you haven't worshiped with us before, we're excited to have you here with us this morning. Um, if you're a visitor, I just encourage you to feel free to fill out a visitor's card. Uh, you'll find them located in the pews, and you can just drop that um, in the offering plate when it goes around during the collection later this morning. I have a few really important announcements uh, that I need to make. Uh, for the next two weeks, the Fellowship Hall building will be unavailable uh, for any use due to the renovation work in progress. So we're really excited about all the work that's going on. It looks great, uh, but it does make the building unusable right now. Uh, the contractors are removing the popcorn finish from the ceilings. In fact, I think they're largely done with that. Uh, they're refinishing the ceilings, they're priming, and they're repainting much of the interior building. So this is going to impact the, the following ministries both today and next week. So for today and next week, of course, all children's Sunday school will be suspended. Um, you're welcome to bring your children to the adult Sunday school class uh, next week in the morning. We uh, meet in here. Uh, the nursery is going to be unavailable today and next week. Um, and the worship, but the worship training room in the back is still available for both Sunday school and worship. Um, so that's available to you. Um, in addition, there'll be no choir practice either today after worship or next week, June 19th. So we'll begin again on the 26th. Um, and there'll be no evening worship either this evening or next week. We'll resume that on the 26th as well. Um, there's a number of us going to General Assembly next week, and so I would just ask, not this week, but the following week, so we'll be out um, on the 19th and following. So I just ask that you be in prayer for us as we go to General Assembly. There's just a number of major um, uh, issues we're working through, and uh, we just ask for your prayers and God's blessing upon those discussions. Uh, we're, having, we're privileged to have a guest pianist with us today, Mrs. Abby uh, Lockabee. She'll be playing for us. And as you notice, um, I'm not Pastor Nick Batzig, I'm ruling elder D.B. Cummings. Um, Pastor Batzig is on vacation today, along with almost all of the church officers. There's just two officers here today, uh, work, uh, Dean Walters and myself, so have mercy on us. Um, but um, we are very excited to have Pastor Aaron um, Halbert with us. Um, he and his wife, Rachel, uh, and their family are serving in Honduras with Mission to the World. Uh, there's a biography um, of uh, Pastor uh, Halbert and, and Rachel in the back of your bulletin. You'll find it right uh, below the postlude. Post I encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, but right now, I'd like to uh, invite Pastor Aaron to come up. He's just going to give you a, a, a brief summary of what's going on in their ministry. Um, and then we'll, after that, we'll look at the meditative verse and begin worship. It is uh, a joy and a delight to be with y'all this uh, Lord's Day morning and to greet you in the name of the Lord. We are uh, Aaron and Rachel Halbert, my five kids, Ford, Catherine, Riley, Whitley, and Ann Waverly. Uh, the kids are nine, eight, and the triplets are six. Uh, and the Lord in his kindness has blessed us with uh, a full brood, uh, and so we're thankful for that. Um, I am one of your newest uh, supported missionaries, and for that, I first and foremost want to say thank you. We are grateful for your support of the work in Honduras. Uh, as we worship today, the folks in Tegucigalpa will gather to worship at about 10 o'clock. Uh, we are preaching through first, uh, Second Samuel right now, so you are going to get a taste of Second Samuel uh, this morning. The Lord in His kindness took us back to Honduras about seven years ago. Uh, one year of language school, and then uh, the in language school, we found out that my wife was pregnant with the triplets. We did embryo adoption, and so the th second year of living in Honduras was more like uh, survival mode because we had a two-year-old, a one-year-old, and then triplets on the way. And soon after that, we planted the church, uh, Iglesia Presbiteriana Gracia Soberana, which is Sovereign Grace Presbyterian Church. It's the first Presbyterian church in Tegucigalpa, actually in Honduras. Uh, and so our goal has been to plant a denomination. And one of the things that's really encouraging about doing church planting is that you can trust that the word of God doesn't return void. That every time we stand up here to preach that the one who does the work is the Lord God. It is him who says his word won't return void. And that's what we're doing in Honduras, preaching and praying and singing and reading and seeing the word and the sacraments and just praying that the Lord will cause increase. So five years ago with Josue Pineda, who is a, 
a national partner. We started the church with about 25 folks, and then we just received new members uh, two weeks ago, and now we have about 90 members in the church and about a, a regular attendance in the mornings around 100, 110 folks that are coming, and then there are a lot of visitors, and we just had our annual conference, uh, Doctrina para la Vida, Doctrines for Life, which Corey Brock, a friend from Edinburgh, came over and taught uh, on the kingdom of God. And so one of the things we want to see done is an, a, a denomination established in Tegucigalpa, actually in Honduras. We're looking to plant another church in about two years. And so we're grateful for your support and for your prayers for the work in Honduras. Pray for our faithfulness, that we wouldn't ever stop wanting to hear the goodness of the gospel preached week in and week out. Pray for our family. We're traveling this week and for GA, uh, visiting a few churches, and so there's a lot of movement going on. But it's a joy to be with you, and we're really grateful to be here, and thank you for your support and prayers. As we uh, prepare to worship, um, I encourage you to reflect on these words from Titus chapter 3 um, during the prelude. Hear, hear now the word of God from Titus chapter 3. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This morning it is the Lord who calls us to worship, and he calls us to worship from Psalm 111, verses 1 to 4. It says, Praise the Lord, I will extol the Lord with all my heart, in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the ability to come in and worship you this morning. We do thank you that we can remember your gracious kindness to us, that we can remember your hesed, your, your dogged, determined love that hunts us down and, and calls us unto yourself. We thank you that it is you who has called us to worship. We thank you that we can gather to sing your praises. We ask that you would help us to worship you in spirit and in truth, that our thoughts would be captivated by the glory of our God, that we would would be convicted of our sins, that we would be reminded of our hope in the gospel, and that we would be reminded that we are pilgrims headed to a better country. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Brethren, I would invite you to stand and, and take your bulletin, and we will sing the hymn of praise, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us.
be seated. Hear now the law of God from James chapter 5, verses 7 through 12. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have been, who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. None of us. None of us have kept these words in all their depth and to the extent of what God requires of us. Now, having broken God's laws so many times and in so many ways, let us go to the Lord now in confession of our sin. We'll first confess our sins silently, and then we will confess our sins together using the prayer confession that is printed in the bulletin. Let us confess silently. Now that we have each confessed our sins to God in our hearts, let us confess together with one voice using these words printed in the bulletin. Almighty God, If you are looking to the Lord Jesus Christ alone for your salvation and are resting in his finished work on the cross, receive now this assurance of pardon from our God in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let us now confess together the faith that we believe using questions 20 and 21 of the Heidelberg Catechism. I'll ask each of the questions and in turn we'll confess the answers together. Question 20. Are all people then saved through Christ Jesus as they were lost through Adam? No. What is true faith?
Our Old Testament reading is from the book of Genesis. in chapter 43, verses 1 through 34. I encourage you to read along in your Bibles. Genesis 43, beginning with the first verse. Now the famine was severe in the land, And when they had eaten the grain that they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, Go again, buy us a little food. food." But Judah said to him, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you will send your brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. Israel said, Why did you treat me so badly as to tell the man that you had another brother? They replied, The man questioned us carefully about ourselves and our kindred, saying, Is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? What we told him was in answer to those questions. Could we in any way know that he would say, Bring your brother down? And Judah said to Israel, his father, Send the boy with me, and we will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I'll be a pledge of his safety. For my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. If we had not delayed, we would, not, we would now have returned twice. Then their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bags and carry a present down to the man, a little balm and a little honey, gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts, and almonds. Take double the money with you. Carry back with you the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take also your brother and also arise. Go again to the man. May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man, and may he send you back to your other brother and Benjamin. And as for me, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. So the men took this present, and they took double the money with them and Benjamin. They arose and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, Bring the men into the house and slaughter an animal and make ready for the men to dine with me at noon. The men did as Joseph, the man did as Joseph told him and brought the men to Joseph's house. And the men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house and they said, it is because of the money which was replaced in our sacks the first time that we are brought in so that he may assault us and fall upon us to make us servants and seize our donkeys. So they went up to the steward of, the, of Joseph's house and spoke with him at the door of the house and said, O oh my Lord, we came down the first time to buy food, and when we came to the lodging place, we opened our sacks, and there was each man's money in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. So we brought it again with us, and we brought the other money down with us to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. He replied, Peace to you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has put treasure in your sacks for you. I received your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them, and when the man had brought the men into Joseph's house and given them water, and they had washed their feet, and when he had given their donkeys fodder, they prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon, for they had heard that they should eat bread there. When Joseph came home, they brought into the house to him the present that they had with them, and bowed down to him to the ground. And he inquired about their welfare and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? They said, Your servant, our father, is well. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads and prostrated themselves. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son. And he said, Is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? God be gracious to you, my son. Then Joseph hurried out, for his compassion grew warm for his brother, and he sought a place to weep. And he entered his chamber and wept there. Then he washed his face and came out, and controlling himself, he said, Serve the food. They served him by himself and them by themselves and the Egyptians who ate him ate with him by themselves because the Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. And they sat before him the firstborn according to his birthright and the youngest according to his youth and the men looked at one another in amazement portions were taken to them from Joseph's table but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs and they drank and were merry with him. So ends the reading of God's holy word. 
As we come back to give to the Lord this this morning, I want to remind you of these words from Deuteronomy chapter 8. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is to, as it is today. Um, as the offering is collected this morning, we'll sing together, His Mercy is More. You'll find that printed in your bulletin. As we sing and the offering is collected, uh, please remain seated. Please join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, King of the universe, almighty God, we go to your throne boldly, not because of any righteousness that we have, but solely because of Christ and him crucified for our sins. Oh Lord, we thank you for this great privilege. The world looks upon us as fools, as they wonder us, praying to, to you, O God, but we know that the foolishness of the gospel is our salvation. But Lord, we are a weak people. We struggle each and every day with doubt and temptation. And we ask, O Lord, that, that you pour out upon us faithfulness, that you remind us each and every moment of Christ and him crucified, that you encourage us in your word. We thank you, O Lord, for this church and her faithfulness. We thank you for the years that the gospel has been faithfully preached here. We thank you for this denomination, for the PCA. We thank you for all those churches in our denomination and outside who faithfully preach the gospel week in and week out, who proclaim Christ for the redemption of sins. Lord, it seems that every day more darkness grows in our world but remind us that you have not ceased to sit on your throne. And it's it's at moments like these when the darkness of sin seems so great that you glorify yourself and we, your weak vessels. Help us to stand faithful, O Lord. Well and up in our hearts' compassion. Remind us of who we were 
and remind us of who we are in Christ, that we would look upon our lost neighbor with compassion, that we would speak to them frankly about their sin, and that we would speak to them boldly in love about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us approach them with gentleness and respect, but let us never step away from the gospel. Let us never concede to the world. Let us never be lovers of money or lovers of praise of man, but rather let us be faithful to you, O God, our Father. We pray this morning for the officers of this church, for our deacons, for our ruling elders, and for our pastors. We thank you for the faithful men that you have set generation after generation in this church to be both shepherds and servants of your people. But we are, O Lord, weak men with feet of clay, sometimes with stubborn hearts, and we need to be reminded of Christ and him crucified for our sins. Encourage us, embolden us, give us love and compassion for the people that you have put in our trust, and remind us that we are to speak the gospel to them. Lord, I pray for all of us who are going to General Assembly next week, not only from this church, but across the PCA. There are difficult matters and difficult times, but every generation deals with a particular struggle. And Lord, you have been faithful to generation after generation of those you have redeemed. Bring us unity and peace, true unity in the gospel of Jesus Christ, true peace in agreement upon your word. Let us seek to glorify you, to love you with all our hearts and souls and minds and our neighbors as ourselves. Let this GA be a light shining in the darkness, a beacon of hope to the world, that we would be, as we stand there, casting our votes and making our decisions, that we would do it for your glory and for your people. We pray for all the committees and ministry teams of this church. We thank you for all the members of our congregation who are so willing to serve. It's encouraging to the hearts of your officers here to see so many people involved in the life of this church. Remind them that they don't need to do it perfectly, that they just need to do it in love of you and your people. We pray for all the ministry needs of the church, both diaconal and shepherding, that we would meet them. We ask that you would care for the the people of this church, for all those who are hurting, for those struggling with physical suffering, those with mental suffering, those with spiritual suffering, that as you work in their hearts and lives, that you would give us hearts and compassion to love and minister to them as well. We pray for those who are ill or struggling with physical suffering. We think specifically of Ron Doyle as he goes to surgery, as he has surgery on Tuesday, goes into the hospital tomorrow, that your hand of healing would be upon him, that you would give comfort to him and Carol, that you would remind him that he is secure in you. We pray for, for all the women of our church who are pregnant right now, for Alex Casey and for Melissa Prim and for Ashley Mulock. We thank you for the continual reminder of new life. As we see the children of this church, we're reminded that you continue to build your kingdom not only out of the world, but through the ordinary generation of the people of God. We ask that you bless those children, that they would never be a day when they would know Christ, would not know Christ and him crucified. That they would be, they would experience the love of Christ in the family of this church. And that they would always think of the church as a place of safety and comfort and reminder of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for Pastor Aaron and his family and his ministry in Honduras. We just, we thank you, O God, that you have called men and their families out to the mission field, that the gospel continues to go out among the nations. Remind us of how important that work is. Never let let us forget to not only provide the physical means of serving them, but also prayer every day for our missionaries. We pray for all our missionaries that you would bless them in their unique work in the world and that we be reminded of the great commission of the church of Jesus Christ to make disciples. 
And, O Lord, as Pastor Aaron comes this morning to preach the gospel, we ask that we would have fertile hearts, that our minds would be sensitive to the word, that we would be both encouraged and convicted, and that we would take the gospel that we hear this morning out into the world this week, not only encouraging ourselves and our families, but ready, ready to give an answer for the hope that we have. We thank you for this day and for this week and all the challenges therein. We ask that you be with us in every moment of every day, that we not get mired down in the temporal, but our hearts and minds would be focused on the temporal, on the eternal, that we might glorify you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen. At this time, I'd just like to, to welcome uh, Pastor Albert into the pulpit uh, to give a, uh, deliver to us God's word. you have your copy of God's Word, I would invite you to turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 5. 2 Samuel chapter 5. Today I will tell you that I am really thankful for technology. I walked out of the place we're staying with my notes left on the bed, and so I'm using my cell phone and notes on Apple. So I'm really thankful for the fact that the Lord has given us this new technology, right? It's not that new, but I'm glad that they're still right here in front of me. Uh, it is a joy to get to preach God's word to you. I pray that it will be a blessing to you. And let's turn our attention to God's word. I would just encourage you to recognize that this is God's holy word. It is the power unto salvation. I would invite you to place attention to what the Lord is doing. Uh, there are theologians who mention that they had many of people saved, not at their preaching, but at the reading of the Word. The Word of God is powerful, and so pay attention as we read it. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and flesh. In times past, when Saul was king over us, it was you who led us out, or led, who led out and brought in Israel. And the Lord said to you, you shall be shepherd of my people Israel, and you shall be prince over Israel. So all the, all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. At Hebron he reigned over Judah. Seven, seven years and six months. And at Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem again against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who said to David, you will not come in here, but the blind and the lame will ward you off, thinking, David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. And David said on that day, whoever would strike the Jebusites, let him get up the water shaft to attack the lame and the blind who are hated by David's soul. Therefore it is said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. And David lived in the stronghold and called it the city of David. And David built the city all around from the Milo inward. And David became greater and greater. For the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. And Hiram, king of, the, of Tyre, sent messengers to David and cedar trees, also carpenters and masons who built David a house. And David knew that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. And David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem after he came from Hebron. And more sons and daughters were born to David. And these are the names of those who were born to him in Jerusalem. Shemua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ibhar, Elishua, Nepheg, Japhia, Elishama, Eliada, and Eliphalet. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. But David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up against the Philistines? 
Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. And David came to Baal Perazim, and David defeated them there. And he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breaking flood. Therefore, the name of this place or that place is called Baal Perazim. Perazim. And the Philistines left their idols there. And David and his men carried them away. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, You shall go up, go around to their rear and come against them opposite the balsam tree. And when you hear the sound of marching in the, troop, in the tops of the balsam trees, then rouse yourself. And then the Lord God, uh, for then the Lord God has gone out before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. And David did as the Lord commanded him and struck down the Philistines from Geba to Gezer. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we turn to you once again and thank you for the power of the word and thank you for the reality that we can trust your word. And so we ask, Lord, that as we spend these next minutes looking at this text, we, we ask that you would allow us to learn of the glory of our God, of the faithfulness of our God, that we would see that you have been way more faithful to us than we can even begin to comprehend. Lord, we pray that your name would be magnified. Lord, the things that are drawing our attention right now as we come to hear your word, we ask that we would be able to lay them aside. The things that come this week, the the family issues, the, the struggles with work or businesses or whatever is going on, Lord. As we look and think about what's going on in the world, we know that we have a God who is faithful, and so we ask that you would lift our eyes heavenward. Oh, we have come to see Jesus. Please grant us that we may see him, and we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. So, as we come to this text, we oftentimes think about things that never change. I served in a church in Yazoo City, Mississippi, during my time at RTS in Jackson, One of the things that used to drive me nuts about Yazoo City was that at Second Presbyterian Church, everybody always sat in the exact same spot, right? They always came in. And when I got there as an intern, my goal was to sit in everybody's seat to force them to have to sit somewhere else because it drove me nuts. But they loved the fact that their seats never changed. And now, looking back on that... As I close my eyes, Lord's Day by Lord's Day, to pray for them, I know exactly where they're sitting every Sunday. I know the exact seats, which row the Cokers are in, which row the Thompsons are in, which row the Peasters are in, and they're there worshiping the Lord. Because we all have this tendency of not liking things to change. I was thinking about that last week as I was Uh, taking a friend out to eat at a place called El Patio in Tegucigalpa. It's a steak place, and I've been going there since I was a kid. And they've moved locations, but the best part about it is that I can go to that place and they serve the exact same steak that I got when I was a kid. And it tastes exactly the same. And there's something about knowing that things don't change. Last example I'll give you is Growing up as a missionary kid in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, we got to fly back to Nashville, Tennessee, where my grandparents lived. My grandparents lived there uh, since 1948, and they, they moved in the early 2000s. But I can still remember going with my brothers, and there was a sound to my grandparents' door that it made. And there was two or three steps, and then you walked up. And then what would hit you is the smell of my grandparents' house. Still to this day, I can close my eyes and smell my grandparents' house. And sometimes when I'm walking, I'll catch a whiff of something that smells very similar. And I close my eyes, and where am I? I'm standing in my grandparents' um, living room in Nashville, Tennessee. And it brings back all the memories. And in much the same way, this text is dripping or filled with the smell of God's faithfulness. It's a group of stories that are not exactly in order as far as 
uh, time-wise. So it's jumping around in the story of David. But the, the goal of the text is to draw our minds heavenward. The goal of the text is to make us see the God of David. It is about God and about God's faithfulness. And all that we're going to come up against in this text is the unchanging, immutable God. This God who has been the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so what we're going to see in David's life in these little stories that we see along the way is how God has been continually faithful to his word, continually faithful to David, continually faithful even when David is unfaithful, continually faithful to his people. He is not a God who forgets. And so this text is filled with the aroma of God's faithfulness. And the first way we see that is God's faithfulness to the promise God's faithfulness to the promise. And we see that in verses 1 to 10. It says in verse 1, Then all the tribes of Israel came to Hebron, to David at Hebron, and said, Behold, we are your bone and flesh. In, that, in, that, in times past, when Saul was king over us, it was you that led us out and brought in Israel. And the Lord said to you, You shall be the shepherd of my people." And so this whole large crowd comes to David to come and to anoint him king. And if we were to flip over to 1 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles, I'll flip there for you, 1 Chronicles 12 and verses 38 to 40, we get a little bit of the feel of what's going on. It says, all these men, men of war, arrayed in battle order, came to Hebron. We're in 1 Chronicles 12, verse 38, Hebron, with a whole heart to make David king over Israel. Likewise, all the rest of Israel were of a single mind to make David king. And they were there with David for three days, eating and drinking, for their brothers had made preparation for them. So what we see is this whole group of warriors shows up. All of Israel has come to to anoint David. And if you want a context of that, it's most likely around 300,000 men have shown up. That's the entirety of Charleston property, proper and Savannah together, all in military garb, showing up to anoint David. This was a show. This was something that they came to show that God has been faithful. And so they've come to anoint the king. And you have to think that for David which we'll get to in a minute, when he had been hiding in a cave, running from Saul, how different the situation must be, looking up and seeing 300 armed men coming to make him king. And they come to tell him why they've come. That's what they tell him in verses 1 and verse 2. They say, you are our bone and flesh. You are one of us, David, and you have been a leader to us. You are the one who has led us in and out. But most of all, why have they come? Look at the end of verse 2. It says, you shall be a shepherd for my people and you shall be prince over Israel. Why are they coming to anoint David? Because of God's word. Because of God's promise. Because God has said so. And they show up to anoint David. And it must be a moment in the the life of David where he's thinking about all the difficulties. And you, if you were to read verses, uh, chapters two, three, and four coming up to this, it's all these inter-battles within Israel. People trying Abner and Joab and Ishbosheth and all these people trying uh, Rob and, and Bana are trying, Rakab and Bana are trying to take over and get in David's good graces, so they kill Ishbosheth. Before that, you've got Joab and, and Abner fighting over who's going to lead, and, and it's all this disorder. And yet, what we see is that God's promise is staying the same, God's word is coming true. That all the unrest, all of Saul's opposition against David, people taking things into their own hands. Now the promise is coming true because God has said, you shall be shepherd of my people Israel and you shall be their prince. And so we see that God is faithful to his word in light of all that is going on. And the promise is held true. It's held firm. Nothing has changed. 
There's nothing that can destroy the promise of God's word. There's nothing, no sin, nothing that man does because God is faithful to his word. No matter how much the, the, the armies of the world, no matter how much the things going around us seem like it's going haywire, God is being faithful. And that's an easy study in the life of David. David gets called to be king and says he will be king over his brothers. And then the whole story is Jonathan giving that kingship to him. And then from that, from getting that kingship, what happens? Saul constantly is hunting him in order to kill him. And David has been waiting and waiting and waiting. And oftentimes we struggle to wait the 30 seconds when Netflix tells us do you want to watch the next, the, the next episode? And we're just hitting next, 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 next. And David's been waiting years, running into caves, hiding, feeling the tension, and sitting in that cave going, Lord, you said I was going to be king. This does not feel like kingship. But now the whole thing has changed. It's been flipped on its head. And David is standing there looking at all these men gathered to anoint him as king. And the text in Chronicles says, and they drank and they ate. They threw a party for David's becoming king because God has been faithful to his word. He hasn't changed. He has stayed the same. And I love what Ralph Davis says here. And then if you want an illustration of this, God gives you the Jebusites in verses 6 to eight, and oftentimes we think, what do the Jebusites have to do with God's faithfulness? Turn with me really quickly to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. This is when Abraham is given the promise. When Abraham's given the promise, God tells him all that is going to happen. In verses 18 to 21, it says in Genesis 15, as God is making the promise to Abraham, it says, On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Can Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. So for years, there had been battles going on for the land. And finally, David is getting the last bit of the land that God has promised. That David is finally getting the whole of the kingdom given to him under his power. And so God has kept his word to David, even in giving him this land that is the, that of the Jebusites who are mocking David, acting as if, if he can't break in and, and take the land and you see that God has given him even that. And the amazing part, brethren, is that is 800 years of waiting. 800 years of waiting. You can understand why they threw a party when they, they brought David's kingship into reality. As they bring David to, to uh, the word in Spanish is ungirlo, to anoint him, is they come and they bring him and they throw a party because God has been faithful. They're celebrating God's goodness. There is joy in the house of the Lord because God has been faithful to his word. Brethren, as we come to gather, that is true for us as well, that God has been faithful. He has not stopped. As we heard even in our prayers that the Lord is continuing to give covenant children to this church. He's being faithful to his word. He's being faithful to raise up the church, even as the things seem dire and meek and and we look around, not meek, but, but murky, and we look around and we think, what is going on for an outsider coming into the U.S. and having to pay, pay for gas for the first time in the U.S. after a few years being gone? It's overwhelming, and you think, what is going on? And we can get caught up in all of that. But the focus of this text is in light of all those situations going haywire and all that's going on as people are trying to get the kingdom and trying to kill people so that they can have power God is staying the same. God is being faithful to his people. God is the one who hasn't changed in all of this. And so what does it do for God's people? What does it do for us 
It causes us to recognize that we can trust God's word, that we can find our hope in his promises, that he does not change, that he is the one who is perfect and without fail. That his word to call in sinners, his word to continue to build his church is is based in him and not in us. You see, time doesn't change his word. Enemies can't change his word. Our lack of faith does not diminish his word. He is more faithful than any of us can even begin to imagine. We cannot even begin to understand the glory and the faithfulness of God. And so we see that God is, all of this is based in God's faithfulness to David. And it's what David comes to understand, that this faithfulness, as we maybe have sung, I don't know if you guys sing the song, O love that will not let me go. O joy that seekest me through pain, I close my heart to thee, I, tra- I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and feel the promise is not vain. You see what for 800 years the people of God have been doing is tracing the rainbow through the rain. And we as believers are tracing the rainbow through the rain on this side of Christ and what he has done. We see his faithfulness to us. We see how he has called us unto himself. We see how he has given us Christ to save us. We see the glory of Jesus Christ and we rest in the fact that he is a God of promise. A God who does not change. A God who will, and we will see this in a minute, fight for his people and will show us how he will do that. But you see, in midst of of all these people coming, in midst of all that has happened, the center of the text draws us to the second thing we we see, the understanding of God's faithfulness. So if if we saw firstly the faithfulness of God to his promise, we now see understanding God's faithfulness. Verses 11 and 12 help us see that other kingdoms are sending, sending things to David to recognize his kingship. And it says, And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David and cedar trees, also carpenters and masons who built David a house. In the center of the text, verse 12, And David knew that the Lord had established him over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people. David gets the very center of the idea. He stands with all the men out there in front of him. He thinks back over all the years of running and hiding and having the opportunity to kill Saul. And he understands. The word in Spanish is comprender it's deeper than just understand it's a comprehension it's a deep deep heart level understanding of what God has done God has been faithful to me and he looks around and he and he recognizes that faithfulness and he sees how God has done it and the focus of it is not David if you look at it it says David understood right and he knew that the Lord had established him king over Israel. But who is it that has established David? It is God who has established David. It is God who has done the work. It is God who has been faithful to his word. It is God who has not changed. And it is God who has done it for the sake of his people. And so we can oftentimes think that David is the the center of the story, that it's all about David and what, what David has done. No, the center of the story is God and what God has done. It is God who has been faithful to his word. It is God who has established this kingdom. It is God who is sustaining David because God has made a promise to his people and he will uphold his promise. And if we come thinking that this story is just about David, we've missed the point. We miss the point because the focus is to get us to look at our God. The idea is that we must look at our God. It is Him who sustains us. It is Him who never changes. It is why we're going to sing at the end, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And hopefully I'll start on time, right, when we sing. And so the idea will be that God is the one being faithful to us. And He's doing it not just for David. He's doing it for His people. 
God is being faithful to his word because he's being faithful to his character. God has made a promise that he is fulfilling. It is him that is going to to bring this to bear because God cannot go against his very character. And so the driving point is look to your God. Look to the character of your God who has been faithful. If he's been faithful to David in this way, faithful to Israel for hundreds of years, he hasn't changed today. But oftentimes in our situations, we can become very forgetful. You sit at home as a mom with a bunch of kids and you're struggling to see the light. (laughs) The situation is hard. Your job You're struggling because job is not what you expected it to be. And it's hard. Young people, school, you're thinking about the years of study and it's it's hard. And and you think, how are we going to get through this as a worker, as a friend, as a husband, as a wife? As you battle with your own sin and the reality that you struggle with sin and you think, how is this going to get better? The goal is that we will look to our God who is faithful to finish the work that he has begun in us. That he hasn't changed. He hasn't stopped doing that. He is continually at work within you. If you are a believer today, you can rest in the fact that God will finish the work that he started. It may feel like at the end of this year, you have only advanced millimeters. But the truth is, is that even if it's millimeters, he will finish the work. It is to look to your God and the faithfulness of him, not to yourself. It is to look at that he has committed to be faithful to his people. He has been committed. And you want to know why he has to be committed in that way? Because we're reminded of David's unfaithfulness. Look at verse 13. It says, And David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem after he came from Hebron, and more sons and daughters were born to David. Notice the contrast. God being faithful time and time and time again. And look at David. He's been given the kingship. And then we read, he took more women. David is falling still in front of our eyes in his sin. If we just flip forward to chapters 11 and 12, we're going to see that that this is a struggle for David when we get to Bathsheba. David has continually been the one who's been called to be king, but he continues to fail. And we're reminded of the fact that he is a sinner. Why? Because David is just just a shadow of the king we're truly waiting for. He's a shadow of Christ. It's pointing forward to this Jesus. And so David is a sinner. He's a a flawed man, a man who needs to to be redeemed just like us and it points us not to find our hope in men it reminds us that our ultimate hope is not in the preacher in the pulpit our ultimate hope is not in men who can save us but it is to look to the king the true king who lived a perfect life who came and died for sinners such as us you realize that this text is just thrown out there that's just a reminder Hey, Israel, your hope isn't in this king. Your hope is in the one to come. It's interesting because this isn't the only time that this has been brought up, that David's kingdom has continued to grow. But isn't it interesting that God is using David's sinfulness for his own glory as the people of God grow? David is being unfaithful and the God of Israel is still being faithful. And so we can see that even as David fails, our our gaze is drawn heavenward. Our gaze is drawn towards Christ. Our gaze is drawn upward. So as David fails, we're reminded one more time of the fact that God at this point didn't stop being faithful. The whole last section of the text from verses 17 to 25 is a reminder of God's faithfulness to his people. He is continuing to be faithful. And so in verse 17, it says, When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed, 
king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. But David heard of it and went down to the strongholds. So David hears that this group of Philistines is coming to take over. David's now king and and they're going to come and destroy him. So David goes down to the stronghold to see what's going on. And you notice the difference between David and Saul in this very moment. Just when we were reminded that he is a sinful man, we're now reminded how David has ups and downs, much like our own Christian life. But David goes down, and what is his first reaction in verse 19 as he looks out over the the, the valley and sees all the, the Philistines in the valley of Rephaim? What does David do? He inquires of the Lord. The difference between David and Saul just in that one phrase. David recognizes his dependence upon the Lord. He goes to his God in the midst of this situation. And just as a brief application, brethren, when you are facing difficulties and trials or family issues or or work issues or, or things in your marriages or with your children, or in school, or, ki- or kids within your siblings or friend groups. Look where David goes first. The instinct is, I must go to my God. I must ask for help, because my God has answers. My God is faithful. My God does not change. He's given me His Word. Is that where we go and hide our hearts and, and lay them before the Lord? And so we can see the difference between him and Saul as he takes his need to God. And we realize that God says he will fight for him. Look at verses 20, verse 20 and verse 24. It says, And David came to Baal Perazim, and David defeated them there. And he said, What? The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breaking flood. Therefore, the name of that place is called Baal Perazim. And then in verse 24 it says, And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then rouse yourself, for then the Lord has gone out before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. Who is the one doing the fighting for David? Who is the one being faithful to David? It is God. David recognizes that it is God who has has broken through. It is God who's done the work so that he could defeat the Philistines. And then it is God who is telling him that he will go out before him and destroy the Philistines. You see that it is God who is showing his power. It is God who will fight for his people. It's the same God in as in the Exodus in chapter 14 where it says you only need to be still and see that he will fight for you. It is this same God who has not changed. It's a God who is saying, I am the God of Israel and I am a warrior for my people. And I will continue to be a warrior for my people. And it's interesting that in verse 21 there's just a a little mark of the weak God of Israel the Philistines it says and the Philistines left their idols there right that's Ralph Davis gave me that and he threw that out and it's just such a great idea God is fighting and the Philistines are are running leaving their gods behind we don't have hope right because this God is a warrior this God is the one who will fight for his people and so what should that cause us to do brethren it should cause us to look to our Christ. You want to know how Christ fights for his people today? It's to look to the cross. It is Christ who has broken through death for us. It is him who has gone before us into that so that we can have access. He has broken the veil so that we can have one in whom we can confidently come to the throne of grace it is through that Christ that we can see how he has fought fought for us and it is foolishness to the world as we even heard prayed foolishness to the world as we come and pray and worship it's foolishness as our friend just preached on the kingdom of God last week and it's foolishness to have this king up on a cross but it is through his death through himself, denying himself for our sake, that he has fought for us, that he might kill the enemy of death, kill our sin, and give us access. You see, Christ hasn't stopped fighting. 
Christ has won the victory. And He will come again one day and He will finish the victory. And so what are we to do as believers? To rest in that. To trust that. To depend upon that. To recognize that He will be faithful to His Word. He will finish the work and He will defeat His enemies. And that's a a truth that we need in Charleston the same as we need in Tegucigalpa the same as they need in India and China and Russia and Ukraine and Africa. That this God has not stopped fighting for his people. He will finish the work he began. He will continue to call people home to himself. He will continue to redeem a people for himself. He will be the one who is more faithful than any of us ever could be. And that's why I told you when I came up here to give kind of my introduction of who I am. That's the comforting part of going and preaching week in and week out. Because it is God through His Spirit that will continue to work. It is Him who continues to establish the church. It is Him who will continue to uphold His bride and protect her. We can rile our hands and worry and we could maybe even feel like maybe we're in the cave like David. But 800 years of waiting and now we're waiting and all we're waiting for is Christ to return and we long for that day and what it does is draw our eyes heavenward and cause us to look to Christ and go, Lord, come quickly. And if He tarries, if we're in Christ, we have a hope that can't be taken away. And so it draws our eyes to look to this Christ who is faithful. But I would encourage you, if you are an unbeliever here, the faithfulness of Christ and that promise of Him fighting for you is for believers. You see, the text says that He destroyed the Philistines. Your sin will fall upon you if you don't turn and, and run to Christ. Christ is the only covering that will grant you freedom from the wrath of God that, that should fall upon you. All of us, but if we are in Christ, we've been relieved because of what Christ has done. I would invite you to come to this Jesus. I would invite you to come and turn and and depend upon Him. He is faithful. You notice that He even mentions in here David's sin. You may think, oh, my sin is, is so great, Aaron. But we just sang during the offering, my sins, they are many. His mercy is more. This Christ is willing and able to save. I invite you to come to Him. If you're a backslidden Christian, if you're hiding sin, if you're living in ways that do not honor Christ, come to Him. Confess your sin. Trust Him. If you're a believer this morning, you're walking in holiness and striving to live for the glory of Christ, look to His faithfulness. See that he hasn't changed. The same Christ that called you 30 years ago, 10 years ago, one year ago, a week ago, is the same Christ today. And he will always be. So look to Christ. You see, brethren, my grandparents sold their house in 2004. I can't go back to that house and get that smell anymore. I can't open the door and breathe it in and go, oh, Gaga and Papa's house. And one day, El Patio, the little place, steak place in Honduras, will probably close. But this God that freely offered his son for the sake of sinners is showing you the links that he will go to to show his faithfulness. The world can fall apart. But this God will never change. His immutability, His unchanging nature should cause us to hope in the midst of everything that's going on around us. I would challenge you. I would encourage you. Look to your Savior. Look to your Christ. Look to this God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We're thankful that it doesn't return void. Lord, we ask that you would continue to encourage us 
in the Word of God, through the Word of God, of your faithfulness to us. Oh Lord, we are a people who are oftentimes slow to remember. Lord, we have to be reminded often, I know I do, of how good and faithful you truly are. Lord, we thank you that there are passages like 2 Samuel chapter 5 that cause us to be reminded of your faithfulness, that cause us to plant our eyes firmly on the fact that you are a God who has been the same since the beginning. Oh Lord, help us to be encouraged by that reality. Help us to rest in your faithfulness. Rest in the fact that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh Lord, cause that to be what causes us to leave this place speaking of your glory. Oh Lord, that you would cause us to share with our neighbors and our friends and our co-workers that don't know you about your character. That it would be the thing that fuels us unto obedience. That we would be enamored with the glory of the cross. And that it would cause us to be joyful people. Not a false joy, not just a smiling, happy-go-lucky person, but that our joy would be rooted in the character of our God. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Brethren, I would invite you to take your bulletins one more time, and we are going to stand and sing the hymn printed in the bulletin, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is Thy Faithfulness.
thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine and 10,000 beside. You go out with that reality. You are reminded of that in the benediction that your God is with you. Now receive the Lord's benediction from Hebrews chapter 13. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with every good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.